This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 171 of Horsemanship Radio, brought to you by Finish Line Fencing, the original and only warranted horse fence of its kind. Horsemanship Radio is part of the family of the Horse Radio Network, and today we have some really interesting guests, too, from South Africa all the way up to Denmark and back really centered now in the U.S. This is Debbie Laux, and you're listening to the Horsemanship Radio. Thank you for joining us. Horsemanship Radio airs on the 1st and the 15th of the month, and I have my producer, Jen, with me today. Hi, Jen. Greetings, Debbie. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Hey, we promised in this episode that we, when we were interviewing these people, that we would start at the top of this episode with the six imperatives that people need to be reasonable to train horses with. Yes, that was inspired ah, because yeah. y'all, Flags Up Farm, there are six imperatives for horses to be good citizens. I call it the Good Citizenship Award That's for a horse. Good. I like that. Yes. Yeah. And what are they? They are super important. This is what we're teaching our adoptables too, which we can talk about. But they are, number one, stand still. <laughs> kind of key. It's imperative. Yeah. <laughs> well, you'd be surprised, right? Back up. And then go forward and then turn left and then turn right and stop. There we go. Seems so simple, right? Seems so simple. Do you know how many champions do not have all six imperatives? If you you have a horse that paws at the in gate of the horse show, your horse does not have one of the imperatives, which is stand still. Stand still. Am I right? That's right. Well, that was inspired because... In order for a horse to have those six imperatives, to gain them, to learn them, to embrace them, because he's got to want to be that way. You can't force yep. him to. Yep. He requires a human to teach it to him because the human's the one causing these these situations where he requires them. But there's probably some imperatives for a human to have in order <laughs> to be a good teacher to that horse. So my challenge to you was, okay. what are the six imperatives for a human to be on his way to being a good horseman. Well, there's really one imperative, and and that's the most important, and that is to understand the horse. Because if you understand how they're so different than us, and you get them, you get that they're flight animals, you get that they're prey animals, they're into pressure animals, you get that that reward for them is not necessarily that peppermint that you gave them, but a reward for them is pressure off. We've talked about that for for years here now, right? Mm -hmm. And and that if you understand and get inside their brain and really and can read their body, then you can do almost anything because you'll be fair and you'll be a good student of the horse. But I think there are some things that make some people they're just born better with horses. And I don't want that as a cop out. Everybody can acquire these things. Yes. It's just harder for some of us than others. But I think somebody who is physiologically quieter, they have an advantage. So if somebody is just a little turbo motor running all the time, horses don't trust that as much. And they're going to have to work on their physiology. If somebody just has a you know average heart rate of about 40 <laughs> all the time... <laughs> Man, they got it made. There's no excuses, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and and somebody who stays in shape, you know, if you're not a potato sack up there, your horses are going to be a lot more mm-hmm. uh, keen on having you up top and pulling on them and everything else too. Um, but and I think there are a lot of people that get into the industry late in life. Um, And still can be just as good because they don't have any bad habits, too. So if anybody's listening to this and they think, dang, I'm 40, I'm 50, I'm 60, I'm 70, and is it too late to get into horses? You could be the best student on the farm, on the at the X Center, you know, so don't be discouraged by that. It really is how well you understand the physiology, the patterns of horses. And um, and I think, you know, these people that we have on that we interview today, Simon and Charlotte and my mom, Pat Roberts, uh, they really are pretty intuitive with their horses, probably so much so that they don't even know how good they are yeah. with their horses. But we can we can replicate that. We can study them and 
learn to breathe deeply and learn to read our horses. You know, and I think there's there's a really cool trend going on in horses. And by trend, I don't mean a fashion. I think it's it's never going to go backwards, is the trend of doing a lot more groundwork before you ever get proficient in the saddle. A lot of people say, hey, I'm okay when I get in the saddle. I'm not afraid at all. But I'm kind of afraid around my horse on the ground, which to me says that you don't really understand your horse enough, you know, because horses don't want to do anything to you. They really, they're not set out to to run you over. They really aren't. But if you understand fears and you watch for the signs of things that might blow up, you're probably not going to get stepped on, you know, but you got to, you got to understand. You got to understand to hold your ground. Things like don't let the horse move your feet. You let him have his little tizzy. You stand there and then reel him back in when he's gone to the end of that should be 12 foot, at least lead line. You know, just understanding all those things can be taught. And that's good news, you know, because a lot of people say, oh, man, he's just a natural born or she's just got it all together. Not necessarily. Uh, Even speaking about these six imperatives for the horse, standing still, uh, there are some really big names. People would recognize them if I said them out loud right now, who can't even stay in a in a ring to accept the ribbon or the trophy. Why? Because the horse won't go won't go there and stand still enough for the for the photo, you know, they either have to walk them in or they have to send somebody in. (laughs) So Mm -hmm. the horse is just so hyped up. Um, that's not good, you know, and, and it's, it doesn't really reflect well. And so it's fun. It's fun to see champions now starting to relax on their horses and especially in the reining and some pretty, pretty extreme sports where they, that you can see the horse go back and just lop eared goes, takes a nap. That didn't happen in like Western reining when I was growing up and cow work, you know, the horse always seemed to be pretty amped up. I mean, how many thoroughbreds on the track thoroughbreds learn to back up? Very few. <laughs> because why would they ever need that gear is what most trainers have thought over the years. But when you see how polite you can mount them if they're taught to stand still, or even back up if they've gone a step or two over the mounting block area, you know, it it's just makes for a nicer life for them and certainly a safer, nicer life for their, for their riders as well. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, there you go. Imperatives for the humans. There you go. Thanks right. for asking. There we go. And, and I'm going to have another challenge because I'm going to take on the next episode, we're going to write this down, the six okay. imperatives for for people to be reasonable to train horses, what I'm going to do is take those six imperatives, stand still, back up, go forward, turn left, turn right, stop, and I'm going to apply them to a human. Okay. You're going to match them up, huh? I'm going to match them up. So stay tuned for the next one. And now it's time to get on to our first guest. But of course, we need to hear from our title sponsor, who is Finish Line Fencing. I'm with Kim and Lisa again from Finish Line Fencing, and we were just chatting about some of the things that people have been bragging about on the Finish Line Fencing, and I thought, you know what, we should put that all together in one spot, and you just like rattle off all the great things that you tell us about Finish Line Fencing, like how strong it is and how easy to install, but uh, shoot, you got the you got the floor now. <laughs> well, thank you, Debbie. So finish line is strong. The standard finish line is 1,250 pounds of tensile strength per strand. Um, finish line XL is 1,850 pounds of tensile strength per strand. Um, it's very, very easy to install. You can use any type of post, wood, T-post, vinyl, honestly, anything. It's it's lightweight. Finish line only weighs 24 pounds, and that's 2,000 feet on a spool. Finish line XL is a 2,000 foot coil and it only weighs 30 pounds. It's also weather resistant. Um, It can withstand UV light temperatures between negative 40 and 130. It never sags. It never loses its tension. It's it's made in three once you install it, which is a great benefit of it. Um, And there's actually no metal wire in it at all. It's a it does not rust, rot, or corrode. It will not injure your animals the way that a standard high tensile fence would. So it's, it's so much safer. And then one thing that we do always recommend with every installation is a strand of electric. It's made to be as a combination fence mm-hmm. with the, the finish line and then the electric. Yeah, so easy to install, lightweight, maintenance-free, no metal wire, no rusting. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't know why anybody would choose anything else. 
<laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. And hedges are hard to maintain. I'd rather put up a fence. So I'm, I'm glad to see that you're out there. And you've been out there for 30 years. So where do people find you and how do they get a hold of you to get their custom job done? Yeah. So you can find us at finishlinefence.com. Our Facebook page is Finish Line Fence. And our phone number is 877-625-6100. And we have a full shop on our website. You can always give us a call. We would be happy to get you a quote. It is great for the do-it-yourselfers. We don't install, but most of our customers just do the installation themselves. That's how easy it is. Simon Duenville became the first Monty Roberts Certified Instructor in Africa in August 2018. He's also one of the only 14 lead-up instructors worldwide, a groundbreaking Monty Roberts program that has been scientifically proven to reduce violence in at-risk youth. From Johannesburg, South Africa, he and his wife Yvette are now living in California, and Simon is resident certified instructor at the Monty Roberts International Learning Center in Solving at Monty's Flag is Up Farms. Well, welcome back. We've got Simon Duinville on the line. And the reason I wanted to bring Simon in is because we've got a lot of fun stories to share with you. And it's going to be an ongoing share too, aren't we, Simon? Yeah, it's really fun. But I thought, you know, since you have become the new resident instructor at the Monty Roberts International Learning Center, it was an important time, I think, an important pivot for both you and the school. And it would be important, I think, to learn a little bit about your background and how you got where you are. It's a pretty incredible story. And it starts with, you were born in Mauritius, am I right? I was born in South Africa, but my father is Mauritian. That's it. Okay. Tell us a little bit about how you, did you grow up with horses? Well, yes, from a young age, I've always been an enthusiast and always wanted to be with horses more than people. Wherever I could and wherever my parents could afford it, we we went out and did camping up in the Druckensburg Mountains and I'd always be hanging around the stables and waiting for the next ride. So, yeah, I, I, I tended to to try and do more riding than anything else. And uh, it was going into, I think it was going into junior junior school that I, I kind of got a, a, a bugbear. Well, I, I kind of saw a couple of, of uh, my colleagues playing polo cross oh. and I really enjoyed the look of it. It was a nice fast game and um, yeah, just running around playing with the ball and the racket and now polo cross is yeah tell us a little bit about that for those who don't know a polo cross is it literally a, like a hybrid between polo and lacrosse yes i would say so similar to lacrosse except you're on a horseback and there's there's three three horses to a team uh positions one two and three i won't go into to the whole the whole uh, yeah you don't have to tell the rules and everything but you know for the regulations <laughs> but a very fast-paced game uh, nice and easy a lot cheaper than polo i would say um you know with polo you need six horses to play six chuckers one one horse per chucker whereas with polo cross you play three chuckers and you've you've only got one horse so a little bit more of a break or rest time in between uh, but you are using the same horse for each chucker so yeah, it, it it was a nice sport. You didn't have to spend a lot of money, and you could do a lot of practice on the ground with your racket and ball, which mm-hmm. uh, which really helps. Yes, I played a bit of polo cross when I was when I was a lot younger. Really enjoyed the sport. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, when I left school, um, I had other priorities, and, and that kind of fell by the wayside for 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 quite a while. Mm-hmm. So. Then that I, uh, love came back. Yeah. Now, number Mauritius, that's your dad. Uh, they have a lot of horse background in there. There's horse racing. How did you get over into the horse racing industry? Eventually, I know you did when you got back into horses. But was that sort of brought in by a love of your from your dad? Uh, yes, I would say so. My dad was always watching the races. I, I, I suppose a lot like your father. Mm. We've got the races on the telly, and there was always betting going on. And I think it's you know having having 
been uh, having been brought up in a in a Mauritian family, with horses being a big part of of the Mauritian life. All, all my my uncles had uh, race horses, so you know my dad was a part of that, which was really nice. Mm-hmm. So when when I'd finished uh, my qualification uh, here at Flags Up Farms, I went back to South Africa, and of course racing being the first thing I I wanted to get involved in. And fortunately enough, I was able to work with some of South Africa's top trainers, one of them being Sean Terry and uh, the other, Diane Stanger. So, mm-hmm. yes, I asked them if I could do a bit of work for them. And before I knew it, I had too many horses than I, than I knew mm-hmm. they wanted to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's amazing. And in 2016, you made a big decision to be certified by Monty Roberts at the Monty Roberts International Learning Center. Or what what created that like frustration in whatever you were doing? I think you were in civil engineering. Or what was it that was appealing about getting back into the horses? Well, interesting story. My wife and I purchased a beautiful property in Johannesburg. And I think the drawing card to me was not the house, but rather the paddocks and stables. Mm-hmm. And um, I think a mistake that a lot of people have made in life, or I certainly have, was we purchased our first two horses online. So <laughs> these these two horses arrived and were offloaded and they jumped out of the trailer and off they went and that was it. We couldn't catch them, we couldn't get near them. We had to figure out how to how to actually work with these horses. And so I did a little bit of research and obviously found quite a few different styles and methods, but um, I um, I found Monty Roberts methods to be the most appealing to me, so I did a little bit of studying and research and YouTubing, and yes, I, I found his join-up methods and gave it a go. And can you believe it? There we go. My horse joined <laughs> up with me, and suddenly yeah. I was able to work with them. Magic, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's good. And and you did you get to see Dad when we went to South Africa? Um, we did go to a few. We I had what we had two or three stops there, I think. I did get to meet him, which was at the Western shop, but uh, I wasn't able to see him at his demonstrations. Okay, good, good. Western shop is, yeah, it's wonderful. That's that's kind of our uh, Dover or our, you know, our our big equipment stores here, tax stores here in the U.S. And uh, so you did get to meet him, so you knew he was real. He wasn't this. I knew uh, he was real. Um, <laughs> I actually sent in a, an application for, for one of my horses for him to work with, but uh, I think she had too many problems, to be honest. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> well, you probably since solved all those problems, so that's great. Yeah, I, I love that um, I read in an article that you wrote that a lot of people believe that there is some sort of magic to it. There is something different about Monty or different about what he does that's like magic. Talk to us about that. How do you address that? There's definitely magic involved, and I think it all it all comes from the studies that he's made on the language of Equus. I think, you know, I always tell people that, you know, if you go to France and you want to find out where you can get fresh bread and you don't speak French, only Mandarin or German, that, that communication between yourself and that person that you are asking help from uh, is going to be quite difficult. Whereas, had you prepared a little bit before and learnt a little bit of French, you would you would find that bread shop pretty quickly. So, you know, in relation to what what Monty has done, he's learned re- he's learned the language of Equus, and he has he's captured the essence of working with horses through their through their own language and body gestures. That's what's really appealing to me. And having learned that and putting it to practice, I just find that my work with horses has just it's just exploded. I can't tell you how much I'm able to do and accomplish with with what I've been taught by by Monty. Yeah, part of the part of the magic they speak of, I think, sometimes for me when I hear the comment something like that, is like it goes too fast almost in their minds. It's um, sure, it's but it's you know it's Monty. He can make it go that fast, but it isn't that duplicatable. It's not that teachable. What do you? How do you respond to that? I would have to disagree with that. I think ah. it's very teachable. Yeah, but you you learned it, I guess. That would be part of part of your part of your statement, anyway. Yeah, and and tell me about you know just give us a little feel for you stepped onto the racetrack over there in South Africa. 
how did they believe you that you're going to be able to help them with these horses? What was the first break that you had in there that uh, it wasn't something just, you know, some ooey concepts of some horse whisper? Well, I think they've they've heard of Monty and they've seen his work done. But as you say, replication of it itself, I think, is in a lot of people's minds doubtable. I think that I had to work really hard and I had to go in and, and sell myself to say that I was able to do this. And fortunately, Diane Stinger gave me a gave me a chance. And yeah, it, it, after working with one or two of her, her babies, she 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 preferred not to work with her her, her, her colts. She said they were a little bit too much of a handful for her, so she gave me two or three of them. And before I knew it, she had put word out to all the other trainers saying, "Oh my gosh, this is unbelievable! Mm. It's so fantastic and so gentle, and this is the way that every that every trainer should be working with their horses." That's how I just ended up doing more and more work, which was fantastic. That is, that's kind of her too, uh, because there isn't a lot of share, just like magicians don't like to share their secrets. Well, there's a lot of horse trainers out there who fall in that same category. Exactly. And some of the things that you've picked up on, though, aren't just horse methodologies. You are now a certified and have been a certified lead up instructor, too. How did that branch suit you? Well, Sure. Well, having been here and working with with Monty and with the, with learning about how to train horses, I was exposed to to some of the programs that he was uh, he was uh, having here. Mm-hmm. So, lead up was working with vulnerable youth, and uh, I just kind of saw what was going on and asked very nicely if I could get involved. And it was really great to see the way that. Horses are able to, we're able to use horses as a platform to work with people and to just help them deal with issues in their life, soften themselves and be able to just come out of their shells. I think working with horses, especially kids, they're able to just feel at peace and just kind of find themselves again. And and horses really mirror them. So they have to really bring themselves down in order to be able to to work with the horse. And when they realize that they've been able to do this with a horse, they're able to carry that on to their everyday living with humans. And I think that's really touching in that we're able to use horses as a platform to help soften people that are suffering whatever they are, whether it's PTSD or abuse or, you know, there's there's loads of things that that, that people need help with and, and essentially horses are the vessel that's helping here. What do you think the long-term effect of that is? Or do you think that's just sort of a nice weekend to open up the door and you hope they go off and work with horses? Or how do you foresee the future of those kids that go through the program? Well, I, I definitely think that there's, hmm, there's, a, there's, I think that these kids, this is always going to be ingrained in what the kids, in, in the kids' minds that they're able to work with with people through working with horses. And I think there's a, there's longevity in it. It's just we need to just keep working with these kids and on these programs to keep, mm-hmm. it, to keep it going. I've definitely seen a very big change in kids that I've worked with in South Africa as well as America on this program. Mm-hmm. And so we've had nothing but good feedback from the, the counselors, the social workers, all saying that the kids are jumping out of bed now instead of, you know, them having to drag them out of bed and the kids mm-hmm. are more sociable with each other. There's a lot of benefits that I can that I can tell you about. That's great. I I know I've seen it in the Horses and Healing, which is the veterans program too. So I I know where for you come from on that. It's it's definitely I mean, but people who know horses well believe that about horses anyway, even if you're just having a bad day and, you know, you're not under therapy, but you kind of are, you have horse therapy and it's pretty good stuff. The horses are the therapists. (laughs) They are, they are, and they're doing a good job of it. So we've got you now at Flag is Up. We're so happy that you achieved your 01 visa. That's just a miracle, number one. (laughs) And then to get through COVID, miracle number two and three. I don't know, it was pretty amazing. Um, so what are your big long-term visions for being there at the farm and, and supporting the programs and growing the school? It's a big question, well, I know. It is. But 
I've got some answers, maybe not mm-hmm. all of them, but I can I can shoot a few out. Okay. I think at the moment our biggest goal is growing the instructor numbers in the US. Um, with COVID at the moment, international travel is looking a little bit sad. So we have, you know, we've we've got this introductory course of horsemanship, which is a 10-day program, really intensive and an incredible program, if I might add. But what we've chosen to do now is actually take that course and put it into two modules, making it a lot, e- not easier, but more accessible for, for our local Americans, you know, for them to take off 12 days, uh, 12 days to come yeah. here to the farm when they have jobs and they've got other commitments, kids and all sorts. It, it, it does pose a little bit of a problem. However, now that we've put it in modular, uh, modular structure, they're able to come for a weekend. It's a th- course per module and there's four modules so once you've done all four that that uh, qualifies as completing your introductory course so i'm hoping to push quite a lot of these modular courses throughout this year of what we've got left and of course next year we're going to punt it quite hard and try and get as many americans in our system and working doing the monty roberts methods as possible Mm -hmm. so that would be one of them then another really exciting program that we are launching, uh, well, we're actually piloting it in the next two weeks, is the Monty Roberts Mustang on Transition Horse Program. So this is a, a program that we have partnered with the Right Horse Initiative um, in partnership with the ASPCA, and that is a, re, a, a rehoming process. So it's horses in transition. So we're basically going to be taking horses in from the Right Horse Partners um, Rescue Centers working with them, training them up, and then putting them up for adoption once they've had once they've had ground manners put in them, remedial issues uh, removed or fixed, and a little bit of ridden work. From there, we, we will be feel comfortable that the horses will be safe and ready for, for, for their potential, uh, their new potential owners. Mm, that's so great. It's so great. There's, I read a stat recently that there's about 200,000 horses available for adoption. They're unwanted horses. Let's put that label on them. That's what this survey um, it was done. A science trial actually was done on it, but it, for an article. And um, the interesting thing was they, as they were doing this, uh, the statistical surveys, there were 1.2 million people that identified as having not only the desire, but also the means to take in horses. So, oh, let's see, we've got 1.2 million people and only 200,000 horses unwanted. We have a problem. We need more horses. Is that crazy? <laughs> <laughs> it does sound crazy. I think the only thing is, like I said, we people are, you know, there's a bit of a stigma around adopting. But mm-hmm. if we are able to bring these horses in, train them, get them safe, I don't see any need why people wouldn't be looking to adopt as opposed to buying. Right. Exactly. It's the right thing. You know, just like it was when uh, people started saying, no, that's a rescue dog I have. You know, I, I don't I don't have to go to breeder. I'm sorry, breeders, but you know, I don't have to go to a breeder. If I've got a life out there, I can save and I'm just as happy to do that. So um, I think there is sort of a place for that new vocation for horses too. And I'm glad you're a part of that. It's wonderful that you're going to send us lots of metrics on that and how that's going and um, be on social media with that. We will do. We're going to, we're going to be making a big thing about this. We're going to be publishing it in as many places as possible. We're going to be doing a a very big social media drive. We'd like to get our name out there. We'd like the horses to be seen. We'd like the partners to be seen. And, of course, all the rescue centers, too. Mm -hmm. It's also a very good way for us to bring people in to see what we are doing, who we are, our methods. And I think altogether it's a fantastic plan that is, is, is going to work. Exciting. Oh, exciting. Well, we're really pleased that you're on the farm, that you made it through all the hoops and that you're, and you're, you still have energy to put forth all these uh, new plans and new exciting programs too. So how do people get a hold of you? Well, they can email me on structure at montyroberts.com or they could give me a call. On, my number is, I think, if I'm not mistaken, it's 805-325-325. Eight, 
That's your cell. Very good. You've done that. 805-325-8414. So anybody, anybody who needs to talk to Simon about this, these new programs or take a course at the school, that would be great. And we have to have Yvette on, your, your lovely wife who came with you too from South Africa. What a commitment you guys have made. Um, yeah. Very grateful to have her here with me too. I'm sure you are. And Tommy, your dog. You Tommy, put, put, dog. put him on the plane as well. In fact, I heard that his ticket costs more than yours. You're two combined? Is that right? It did, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> you are real animal people. I love you for it. That's great. Thanks, Simon, for being on Horsemanship Radio today. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Hi, Debbie. I just had to write and tell you how much I'm enjoying Monty's podcast on Horsemanship Radio. You and Monty and your podcast guests are my company every evening while I'm feeding, cleaning, and finishing up barn chores for the day. I especially enjoyed the recent podcast 158 because so many of the guys that Monty talked about, and especially Greg Ward, were heroes of mine when I was growing up. It was really fun to be a fly on the wall listening to Monty recount all those stories. And I also enjoyed his discussion with Tanya Johnston about the deer and Thigmotaxis. Thanks for all the great information you and your dad are spreading throughout the world. And thanks for making the time doing my barn chores, no chore at all. All the best. Charlotte Bredahl is an American equestrian. She was born in Copenhagen, Denmark, and she won a bronze medal in team dressage at the Summer Olympics in Barcelona and is the U.S. dressage development coach and Olympic team bronze medalist. Charlotte is just recovering from surgery to remove a melanoma in her brain and is doing great. And she shares her comeback therapy involving horses, of course. Well, welcome. I've got two of my favorite ladies on the line, and I'm so happy that we could coordinate this because I've got Charlotte Bredahl Baker, and she is, are you in Moorpark right now? I am, yes. Yeah, and yeah, and just finishing up, you are still so active, and we're really um, so pleased and, and privileged to actually have you out on the road again during COVID time and all these extraordinary things going on. And I've got Pat Roberts' mom on the phone, too. Hi, Mom. Hi there. Can you hear me? Hi. Pretty, yes. Pretty good. much. Pretty much. Kind of quiet. So use your outdoor right, voice. Well, I'll, I'll try to <laughs> project my voice a little bit louder. I'm in the uh, Flag is Up office. So on line three. Right. She is very near our star of the show who won't join us today, but his name is Steel Buns or Bunny, as we like to call him here. And uh, he's going to be kind of the center of the reason I have you two ladies on because this friendship goes back a long way. How long have you two known each other? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> what? 19, 1990. 1990. Really? Or maybe even, maybe, no, maybe it was 88, actually, now that I think about it. Yeah. Yeah, you came up uh, with someone to do a yeah. demonstration in the covered arena. Yeah, for the Reagan Roundup uh, fundraiser. That's what for it was. It was Reagan, Reagan yeah. There's, yes. yeah. Oh, yes. My goodness. So, I think time it has flown. It was either 88. <laughs> that is amazing. That is amazing. So, I mean, that's a lifetime yeah. for a lot of people that are it listening, is. right? I know. <laughs> yeah. For a lot of people who are it listening. Is. And you've been horse girls all along. Uh, Charlotte, we've had you on before and we've talked about you growing up in Denmark and then coming over here uh, in and being a part of the 1988 Olympics. If, am I right? No, no 90, 90, 92. 90, sorry, 92. 92. Barcelona. Olympics, yeah. Barcelona, yep, and doing well there. And people can go back to that episode too. It, it's, a, it's a beautiful story. But your journey has taken you through the competitive world up until just recently, really. What was, what was, what was the day that you finished your last competition, if you're finished with your last competition? No, I actually finished competing, I want to say, two, three years ago, three years ago, I think. Mm -hmm. Probably yeah, well, pretty recent, and, pretty recent, and yeah, then yeah, pretty recent. Yeah, and uh, I've been focused. I've been focused on coaching for the. I've worked for the U.S. Equestrian Federation for. Uh, I'm going on six years now that I've worked as coach for yeah. the for the federation. And that's what you're involved um, in now in Moore Park, is and that that's what I'm. Um, actually, not today. That's private coaching, but I do work 
kind of full time for the U.S. Equestrian Federation. <laughs> Very full time. Me and, too. So. Yeah. Yeah. You're a Pretty hard, hard time. worker. Yeah. And I think you put some of that work ethic to work on your latest challenge, too. I mean, is it COVID? wasn't enough to challenge everybody and their travels and their and their lifestyle of, of competition horses helping these young students. Tell us a little bit about your passion for the the youth and the those up and comers that you're helping develop. Yeah, I mean I've always always enjoyed coaching and I've always enjoyed, you know, helping youth. I mentored a lot of a lot of kids over the years and, and for four years I was assistant youth coach and that was my focus was uh, coaching young riders. But uh, the last two years, I have been what's called development coach. And the riders I work with there are mostly professionals, mostly young professionals. So there's still an element of, of mentorship in that. But um, but it's really the next generation of, of Olympians, we hope. That's... Mm-hmm. Uh, I have a group of typically 25 riders that are in my group. And from that group, hopefully, you know, a lot of them will move on to the elite, which is a group of about 10 that will be the ones that will go to the Olympics and all the really, really big time stuff. That's so And awesome. I love it. I, I love it. It's really, really rewarding. And uh, and since I had my, my operation, I have... Uh, still been working pretty much full time. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, yes, you wonder why. I mean, from home. <laughs> well, yeah, so. it's, a lot of us are, are doing that without any challenges at all, except for not liking technology all that much. But but you, you're, a, you're an amazing woman. And I thought there's an amazing horse that we just mentioned too, Steel Buns. And Mom and Steel Buns are a partnership. Uh, she has shown Steel Buns. How many years did you show Bunny, Mom. I showed Bunny, let's see, he is now 15, and I started showing him when he was about four or five, and I showed him uh, probably for about five years before I, I passed on to Blackie. And uh, for the last five years, I've been showing Blackie, uh, a half-brother, to Steel Buns. Right. And they're still big, big uh, motored horses, and uh, both of them have carried me to some really nice wins. And it's so much fun to watch Charlotte out there in the arena dressage riding him. I guess that's the term. (laughs) And he is such a sweetheart. Oh, my gosh. They they make such a – they look great together. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Charlotte, you share whatever you'd like to about the reason you came to uh, teach him a little Western dressage. (laughs) Yeah, so about the – now going on almost four months ago, I had I was diagnosed with a brain tumor, and um, the reason I found out about it was because I started losing my motor skills, and particularly in my left leg. And as it progressed, it ended. I ended up being basically paralyzed on my entire left side, from my toes to my shoulder, and 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 that was the case when I had the operation. And uh, for about a, a week out of after operation, I was still not able to really do anything. I mean, couldn't get out of bed or couldn't do anything. But then from there on, it started getting better, and, and I ended up in a rehab facility for about six days, which is supposed to be two weeks, but mm-hmm. somebody had arranged for me to get a flight back to California, and uh, and it was just a better situation. I was in Florida at the time when that happened. And so anyways, when I got back to, to California, of course, it was all about getting rehabbed as quickly as possible. And, and I really put, you know, 100% into that, doing everything I was able to slowly, of course. And in the beginning, I, I was not for sure not able to ride. And But after about two months of just working on walking and all the real, real basic stuff, I decided that I really was wanting to get on a horse, and I felt I was ready to get on a horse. But obviously, I wanted a really, really safe, quiet, mm-hmm. quiet horse, and not too big. <laughs> of course, the warmbloods are very big. Yeah. And so, so I called Pat because I know they always had some really wonderful, wonderful quarter horses. And I, and I actually had been on steel ones before, but I, but I 
didn't think of him at the time because when I called Pat, I just assumed he was still in that he was still working him. But when I called Pat, she said, "No, you can you can ride steel buns because he's not being he's actually not in work now." And and I just thought that's just perfect, you know. And uh, and at first I was really reluctant. Just the idea of having to get on a mountain block and get on a horse was was scary because I I just had no idea how my balance would be in the beginning. But as soon as I was in the saddle, it really didn't feel that foreign. I mean, that's when the muscle memory from something you've done for so many years kicks in. Mm-hmm. And and it really felt quite good. I mean, of course, I was nervous because I'm you know, terrified of coming off that close to surgery. It was only two months ago. And, of course, it takes a year for something like that to heal up 100%. But anyways, uh, Bunny was absolutely perfect. And uh, I started riding him four or five days a week and just obviously carefully in the beginning. But he was just the perfect, they call him babysitter for me because I, I just... Okay did not have to worry about him doing anything silly and and he's beautifully trained for the, for the reining and it really it does carry over to the dressage quite a lot of it and it's just been so much fun riding him and of course in the beginning he had it very easy but now you know once I was feeling a lot stronger and my legs were feeling more equal in strength and so now he's he's having to work because now of course I want to turn him into a dressage horse <laughs> <laughs> and he's he's being he's being such a good boy and and he's quite an athletic horse so he's actually he's learning things you know rather rather quickly or very quickly and and is just very very relaxed about it and it's been it's been great fun and and just feeling that progression not only in me but in him too as we go along and it's it's been really great and it's Beautiful. been super great for me get building strength in my leg and my balance. And I, I really feel when I'm on him now, I feel as balanced as I did before the surgery. I really do. Oh, that's amazing. So, and you're not thing. you're you're not just doing physical therapy. You're also dancing and playing tennis. And am I missing anything besides the riding? Well, that is. Those things are my physical therapy. I haven't gone to physical therapy. Yeah. I just I done my own physical therapy. Yeah, <laughs> I did the six days in in Florida when I really couldn't start it from not being able to get out of bed, and then a week later I was able to walk very, very, very slowly. Mm-hmm. And then as soon as I got back to California, I just started doing everything that I that I loved to do before including having a dance instructor come to the house three days a week. And that was actually huge, hugely therapeutic too, because it, you really have to connect to your brain to, to do dance patterns and stuff like that. But then when you have a partner, it, you know, keeps, you know, really helps you with balance and everything. So I wasn't worried about falling. And then my other passion has always been a long time been tennis. And so we have a ball machine and, I would go out and start hitting the tennis ball, but I wasn't moving my feet. I was just focusing on my upper body coordination and the eyeball coordination. And then we had a fitness trainer come in three days a week. And and from there, i just been, you know, and then, like I said, two months in is when I started riding, and that really gave me a big boost forward. So, so yeah, I probably do stuff at least two or three hours every day, whether it's riding tennis or riding dancing or work out or something mm-hmm. and I feel I feel great and I think I feel like I'm back to probably probably 85 percent now at least if not more so and that's that an amazing? incredible timeline that is an incredible timeline some people might take you know a year and hope that they can be is are, are you um, yeah are you a miracle around your doctor's offices are they saying you're you're surpassing every yeah yeah they they kind of they kind of think that I sent a, a little video to my doctor in Florida after <laughs> I had been home I think after I I got on Bunny Access I sent a video to her and and she says are you freaking kidding me <laughs> <laughs> no they were yeah they're very they're very 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 happy yeah so but I I contributed that a lot of it I mean number one is that obviously the surgeon did a great job because the, the tumor was right next to the motor skill. So obviously he did a great job. But I also think the fact that I had all these other things in my life before the operation has been a, a huge thing because the muscle memory really kicks back in 
uh, when you get back to doing the things you already really knew how to do. Oh my um, goodness! So I mean, the, yeah, yeah, the writing and the dancing, especially those two things, because your brain is also very, very involved in those things. You know, it's not yeah. just like running, running or right. swimming or something like that. Just, You're really yeah. your brain is very engaged. So. Yes, there's a strategy to everything. Yes, not just a yeah, not just a sweat. Yeah, mom, can you believe that actually Bunny has responded nearly as well as Charlotte has to the therapy as well? <laughs> I, I swear they're a team. I, Bunny has always been a fast learner and the most generous horse. He just you know he he wants to do well. He he's got this great personality. You, you just everyone that is around him. Oh, he says they just love him because he is such a sweetheart. But he yes. has really, the cream has risen to the top. Just He's in his <laughs> element. And when you see the two of them out there, and he's so willing. It's just, I love watching yeah. him. I go out there on another horse and just watch them, just to see what, what they're doing. But sure. you have to give uh, Charlotte so much credit for uh, making up her mind that she was going to overcome this, and she's doing it yeah. in just the best way possible. It, she, she, she's an inspiration for anyone that's ever gone through something like this. Uh, it's a lesson that you can overcome if you have the desire and the heart and the willingness to put the time into it. So I, I just take my hat yeah. off to Charlotte every day, mm. every day. So Thank true. you, Pat. Thank you. And I am so grateful to have, I mean, he literally is the most perfect horse I could have for this period in my life. No, he really is. I, I could not ask for anything more for every desk. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it, was, a... it, was, it was funny, you know, the first day I came over to get on him, I was expecting him to be like 15 hands, and then because most quarter horses are not that big, and then he was 16-1, I'm like, whoa, <laughs> he's not so small. <laughs> but no, but anyways, it, it has not been, not, been an, not been an issue at all. No, he's he's great. The other day when Pat was watching me, she says, he doesn't move like a quarter horse anymore. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> he, he has these big moves of, you know, a great yeah. big quarter. <laughs> I know. Oh. Um, well, it just it, shows it, that Charlotte's an amazing coach on top of the horse right. and, and yeah. from the ground, too, and in a Zoom too. call, apparently, too. So so really fun, really fun <laughs> to hear all this and to see that people, you know, stay in shape, get people. Get people back in shape so that yeah. you can prepare for moments like setbacks, and then your muscle memory is there. I don't, nobody can do it like Charlotte did, and and I wouldn't expect anybody to expect to. But I think it is inspiring, though, that people should look at setbacks as not the end of something, but something that you can aspire to come back from. And and that's a big message for you know a, a sport that is a bit of an extreme, and there are issues of. In this case, you didn't get bucked off or have any of those problems, no. but but you did have a health setback, and all the muscle memory and all your health actually lent to your coming back, I'm sure. Yeah, I know for sure, for sure. I mean, I, I can't imagine have got, having gone through this if I had been, you know, heavy or really out of shape going into it, that uh, I would have taken, I'm sure, three times as long, if not more. I mean, I can't even imagine. The yeah. difference it would have made. Yeah, for sure. For, mm-hmm. sure, for sure. Well, and Bunny is glad for the exercise, too. He looks fantastic. Oh, yeah. And I think somebody <laughs> should come along and start a Western dressage competition here. So um, <laughs> I know. I know. No, I'm, I'm really having fun fun now training okay. him with the, with doing changes. He started doing, I can do three changes now, you know, three in a row. Ones, three ones on him now. Just started introducing that. <laughs> On the straights. Yeah. Now you're it's graceful. It's beautiful. You guys are just uh, partners like you've been doing it for years. And I think when's the next time you're going to be riding out here? I'm going to come see. I'm going to ride in tomorrow. Okay. I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> okay. okay. I'll let you know what time I get there, but it should be relatively, uh, you know, early morning, not early, early. <laughs> okay. We're, we have our horses and healing here with veterans too, just so you have a heads up. Too. Okay. Yeah. 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 So perfect. Perfect. There. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Thanks, Perfect. ladies, for no, joining us, that. catching up. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Great. 
I'm excited to introduce you to Coro, my new online shopping destination where I can find all my favorite horse care products for the best prices, and they're shipped directly to my barn door. Coro was created for the horse owner and horse care professional whose hard work and dedication goes into caring for their horses. To make it even easier with industry expertise, they have tried and tested products, and they even have horse-inspired storytelling all under one roof. They offer auto ship so that you can never run out of your go-to supplements, your grooming products, your fly sprays, your horse cookies, and more. Where you set the frequency of how often you receive items, as well as you can unlock additional savings they have up there. They even offer an afterpay, which I like, which then splits your payments into four payable every two weeks. It's great. Coro has something for everyone, no matter what breed of horse you have or what their job might be. They care about the way you care about your horse, which is why they have tons of content on their blog. It's what makes them different. Coro stories, and they created a community on their social platforms to help educate and entertain and even inspire horsemen and horsewomen alike. Owning a horse can be expensive. Caring for them shouldn't be. Check out their website today at coroshop.com. That's C-O-R-R-O-S-H-O-P.com. And use the code HORSEMANSHIP10 for 10% off your first order today. This is all for the love of your horse, Coro. Whisper the language of the herd. Listen, you don't have to say a word. It's time for Jamie Jennings to fetch an email from Monty Roberts' inbox and share a morsel of Monty's wisdom in a little segment we like to call Ask Monty. Leave this world a better place in the The magic in the language of the herd. Dear Monty, hello, I love everything you stand for with making the world a better place for horses. If I could have just one minute of your time with a quick reply. I'm working on a project to help my clients who have been in riding accidents or just lost their confidence. Have you ever taken a hit on your confidence when working with horses or other aspects of your life? And if so, what did you do to boost yourself up and overcome it? Thank you so much for your time. I have looked up to you my whole life. Monty's answer. You have to realize that I wasn't in the horse business until I was three years old. You must be aware that as a child, there were many circumstances that frightened me. You should know that my father was one to cast me into situations fraught with danger. My work with horses in a nonviolent fashion as I grew up led me to understand that they mean no harm to a human being. It was then my responsibility to handle each situation as aware of their environment as much as I could possibly be. Once I was fully aware of the underlying principles of equine life, I could never lose my confidence. I often say to students, look in the mirror, you are the problem, not the horse. Change your own actions that simply don't take your confidence away. The better you are as a student of the horse, the more confident you will be. When we get it right, there is every reason to be confident. For more of these insights into good horsemanship, go to MontyRoberts.com and click on the words Ask Monty at the bottom of the page. What in the wide, wide world of sports is going on here? Where in the world is Monty Roberts? Monty is looking forward to meeting some new friends, two-legged and four-legged, and we've got right now this month, the 17th through 19th, the introductory course, Module 2, that's all the join-ups, really fun one, and then 20th, November 20th through 22, we've got the introductory course, Module 3, and that steps you right into the long lining groundwork. Then in December, we have December 1 through 3, the introductory course, Module 4, and that's the last part of the introductory course, intro course of horsemanship, and that is preparation for your intro exam. So that will finish up the year for that. And then we have December 4 through 6, we have our Horses and Healing program for veterans and first responders. And then we'll leap into February. February 8th through 12th, we have a Monty special training coming up, and we're working with all of our Monty Roberts Mustang and Transition Horse program horses in that special training. So we're excited to have students and Monty working with 
adoptable horses. It's really fun. Yeah. I encourage everybody to sign up for that one. Check it all out. And you can find all of that information and a whole lot more at MontyRoberts.com. Spiffy new website that's full of information and super easy to navigate. Mm -hmm. There we go. And if you want to go old school, you can call Monty's Farm, Flag Us Up Farms, on the phone. It's 805-688-6288. Or you can go to MontyRoberts.com and the phone number's there. Amazing. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> For details about today's show, go to horsemanshipradio.com. You're going to find links, photos, and more information about today's guests and topics. We love your feedback. Please go over to Facebook. And if you haven't done so already, like and follow Monty Roberts. He's the one with the little blue check mark. Yep. Um, and put on there things that you love to hear about on the show, guests that you might want to hear about, questions that you have that we lo- you would love to hear us talk about, et cetera, et cetera. That's yeah. the place to do it. Or you can also do it on Twitter because Monty Roberts is on Twitter and his handle there is Monty underscore Roberts. And if I remember right, he is also on Instagram. Yes. Oh, yeah. Gorgeous photos. It's really there fun. There we go. If you're one of those picture people, go over to Instagram, Monty underscore Roberts. And you can get the app for your phone if you haven't done that already. We've got a lot of homework here. Get the Horse Radio <laughs> Network app for your Lots iPhone or your Android. Or if you don't know how to do that. If you don't know how to go to your app store and search for app and download it, find someone with one digit in their age and they will do it for you. That's right. (laughs) Yeah. Don't go to the two digits. (laughs) Don't go to a 20 something. Go to a nine year old. Go to a nine year old now. Eighth grade's perfect. Oh, maybe that's teenagers now. But yeah. And thank you very much to our sponsors. We could not do this show without them. That's Finish Line Fencing. I've got now Coro Horse Products going and Monty Roberts University. We're so excited to have all of those sponsors on board because not only do they love us, they love you and your horses, and they're all good for it. Be sure to visit all the other great shows on the Horse Radio Network at www.horseradionetwork.com. Until next time, have many happy horse hours. (laughs) 